Welcome to the Renew Techless Podcast. I'm Jerry, joined by Brian and Jerry, Jerry, who? Who are you? Listen, if you don't know at this point, uh, I should probably tell you, but <laughs> I'm not going to. You'll, you can just figure it out. My name's spelled with a G, so oddly, I don't know, my parents were just ready with like good SEO oh, yeah, from yeah. the get, you know? Yeah, that's nice. Although there there is another Jerry Thompson who is minister. Brian, or there's several Brian Gottlieb's, but the prominent one is a uh, an editor, I believe, former editor of the Detroit Metro Times. Respectable. Like that. Yeah, it seems like a respectable human, unlike the uh, probably first Brian Gottlieb that you get in search results. I have him just narrowly edged out, I think. Mm. Uh, sorry about that other Brian. Yeah, I, I wonder if they are mad. Anyway, we got, we got a lot to talk about, and I know that last week was doom and gloom, Yep. but I think that this stuff is not bad. Yeah, I was I was pretty pleased with everything going on this week. You know, I, I got my doom and gloom out, and I'm ready to talk talk a little magic. Hell yeah! Okay, so this Saturday I have a couple things going on. First is this legacy ish small tournament thing being hosted by Mason Clark and Honorog. It is 16 players. It is an event where we, we had kind of talked about this, and I think mm-hmm. that this was maybe the thing that like spawned the idea, actually. It was talking about legacy without all of the weird supplemental products. And they're like, that sounds like a good idea. Let's just do this. So there's there's going to be coverage, and I'm one of the people playing in it. And Mason sent me a message and was like, hey, do you want to play in this? And he said that there there has been expressed interest from the legacy community to have you in it. I was like, who, who said that? <laughs> what person? Yeah. What per? And he was like, ah, there was like one guy who like maybe kind of mentioned it or whatever. It's like, yeah, dude, come on. But that guy's going to be really happy. I mean, that's what matters. Uh, I mean, I'm, uh, he's going to be more happy to see Caleb Durward than me or whatever, but you know, it is what it is. Anyway, do you, have- I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to see you play this. And I'm happy to see what you come up with. I I think this is just like a really interesting experiment and maybe one that could pave the way for something exciting in the future. This being like a real format would be very, very exciting. I think, I mean, maybe there's something fundamentally wrong with it, but it, it appears exciting to me. Well, see, I was, I was going to ask you, man, what would you do? (sighs) I mean, (laughs) the the baseline always has to be like just days, force of will wasteland Delver people. And that's, that's never going to be a bad answer. I just think it's impossible that that, doesn't succeed but as far as as far as a viewer experience right you want to do something more interesting and maybe a little out there huh so what what do you think the format looks like i mean have you thought about this at all uh it is it has crossed my mind i i expect that it feels like very i don't know if this is wishful thinking or like reality-based thinking my thought is it will be very pillar ish kind of like how there were pillars before so things that seem like they should succeed very well are like tendrils tendrils combo should be completely fine and i'm happy for that uh like i said delver disruptive like tempo strategy should be very very strong maybe up to and including stifle Uh, if you think about like what is lost by giving up these supplemental products it does feel like it's the more hmm, i'm trying to think it's not it's not really fringe because some of these cards are very 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 few of them feel core to the identity of the decks that they are part of. Uh, Things like Minsk and Boo, like that's, it's just not all that necessary. It's good, it's efficient, and that's why most of these cards succeed. But they never feel all that core to the existing strategy. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Uh, So the the way I looked at it was in in terms of Delver, and I I could be missing a lot here because I have not gone super deep on this, but... For, for Delver specifically, it's like, well, you can't play DRC, mm-hmm. right? So is there like an actual huge reason to just be blue red? And it's like, no, I think you just have to like go back to Tarmogoyf. I think that that sort of describes like the whole format where it's like, oh, that's like OG legacy, right? And then you start thinking yep. about the things that are going to be playable. And it's like, you know, Dark Depths is obviously very good. And a lot of the cards that made that deck good have come from standard sets, not from weirdo supplemental yep. products. Storm, as you mentioned, I think is going to be terrifying because 
There's no fluster storm or force of negation. So, like, so there's there's guys, no modern horizons in this either, right? Correct. Yeah, okay. that's yep. that that's a fake product as far yep. as they're concerned. Yeah, great. And then it was uh, looking at like the the fringier stuff with well, you know, Death and Tax is still good. Maybe like Sneak and Show. Uh, and it's just like, yeah, this is just like 2014 legacy. It seems like. Yeah, just rewinding the clock. And there's a reason like those things sort of came up to be the staples of the format is because they were. I don't want to say broken. They're they're on the border of broken. Like those interactions are just some of the most powerful things you can do. And it's very hard for anything to come out in a standard product to really match that. And that's why those things were sort of set in stone. And what was fun about Legacy is moving the pieces around those cores. They were always in flux. They were always interesting. Uh, but you had to look for like, you know, weirdo technology that could really get you an edge. Things like Envelop being a good card in some spots was always interesting to me. Like that card kind of sucks but i guess there's a, a functionally better one right what's the invasive surgery invasive surgery yeah so so things like that like coming in and out of the metagame that's how the format evolved it wasn't oh this is the new thing we build around it was here's this little upgrade we can use in a very specific set of scenarios for a specific metagame and it's one of the reasons why i found legacy so appealing for so long yeah the the thing that really pisses me off though brian is that my my homie Baleful Strix came from a supplemental product. And yeah. that's the type of thing that I always turn to to beat up on these formats and get an edge. And I've been really struggling to come up with something along those lines that is appealing. So I don't know, man. I guess I I, I built like a crappy blue white control deck or whatever, but it, it also just looks pretty similar to what people are doing now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's not super appealing. And but the, the ban list is going to stay the same, right? Yeah, it's the same ban list. Uro sounds pretty appealing. Honestly, there's got to be something you can do there. Yeah, I, like Uro, I I don't like all that much, honestly. That, just like, like as, as a play experience, as a card. No, I mean, I, I just think that it doesn't line up well against a lot of the decks that I'm scared of. Okay, okay. So uh, like a, as your endgame threat against Delver or whatever, sure, it's good. Mirror matches, it's fine. But against like Storm, Dark Depths, Sneak and Show, even Death and Taxes, not very appealing. Sure, I could see that. And I guess it does make sense like when a format is rooted in degeneracy and you're kind of exploring it. I mean, obviously, like stakes here are pretty low and this is more for fun. But were you trying to like win this tournament, doing degenerate things before the tournament is like, or before the metagame is established? is a very, very successful strategy and just be like, well, they're not going to account for Storm or people haven't played against Storm enough recently to be able to account for it. Although I think the players in this tournament will be very well prepared, uh, you know, fairly talented group of players. So I, I was going to have a lot of deafening silences because I, I don't have force of negation and fluster storm. Right. And yep. those those are always kind of like the go to. So you got to do something a little bit different. Yeah, it's, Storm is terrifying. I, I always respected storm a lot and then it was always underrepresented i think yeah. that that's going to be the case this weekend too but definitely seems very terrifying when you just knock out uh, a lot of different pieces of like counter magic and stuff and then it's like uh, i mean maybe you could find some chalice deck that's worth playing but i think even a lot of the cards from recent sets that have powered up like the mono red blood moon deck or eight mm -hmm. cast or whatever like they all came from supplemental products you know yes, they so yes they did uh, I don't know. I, ooh, dude, maybe I could just play Eldrazi. Maybe that's tight because then I don't really have to think very much. Certainly fits the bill of a good Chalice deck. Uh, obviously, you get your City of Traders, Eldrazi Temple for your mana base. So Ancient Tomb. That sounds sounds very powerful. Yeah. I, mean, I always sideboarded uh, Four Thorns also, but yep. depending on how hateful I wanted to be, I could probably play a main too. I don't know. That was actually the first time that I thought about Eldrazi, so that's interesting. It is interesting. This this sounds very cool, and I am excited to watch, and I'm excited that someone has taken on uh, the goal of seeing what this format looks like. And I'm not going to say I think it will catch on and, and be a thing. It would be really cool if it did, though. Really cool. It's it's basically exactly what I'm looking for. Like That's how I want to play Magic right now. So It would be sweet, but I also feel like there's maybe not enough to actually create churn in the format. I think you're right. And I think that's okay. 
I think that's completely okay. It's fine if there's a little bit, if there's one thing in magic that is a little bit less churny, I think that is 100% okay. And like I've mentioned before, theoretically, the things that should appeal to me are like pre-modern or old school, but those are zero churn. And I I don't want zero churn. I want very, very low churn. That's the product I'm looking for right now. I mean, pre-modern is underexplored to the point where I think that people can come up with like actual brand new decks, whereas this is a format that was being played a lot in 2014, basically with some new stuff. So I I don't know. I I feel like people have kind of like done the reps in this one and done a lot of the exploratory stages and stuff. Maybe maybe uh, that's almost, that's almost 10 years of new stuff though. Like that's, that's a lot to mine through and you know, it's a lot, but it doesn't create new archetypes. It just adds to the stuff that already exists. So I don't know how much that actually does. I assume you're right. I also think though there's cards with potential. I mean, things like, it feels very small ball for legacy, but things like Witch's Oven are recursive engines that are like very powerful, very consistent, very low mana cost, which is critical for these formats. So disruptive elements of oh, like Witch's I, Oven decks into like Goblin Bombardment setups, which were previously a real thing. Uh, I guess you could like dredge if you really wanted to, which is kind of sick. Oh, dude, do not, do not get me excited for dredge. I didn't even think of that. I just thought about Hogak actually, because like that was actually doing well. Oh no, you can't, you can't no, actually Hogak. Hogak. But like, yep. I wonder if you could, yeah, some some sort of looting deck. Like I basically forgot about looting. Yeah, yeah, like like red black looting ish. I mean, this is not a full fully form, formed idea, but like red ba- black looting ish. Witches Oven, Cauldron Familiar. These are all one cost cards that combine to something very, very powerful. Uh, maybe with some like legacy foundation, and you you do get Goblin Bombardment if you want it because it's in Tempest, so <laughs> you're not cheating there right. to get it into your stuff. So yeah, the old Sam Black special. Yeah, yeah. Dust off the lingering souls and just just have a great time. That's what matters. I mean, speaking about losing to Storm, man, geez. Yeah, that's a good way to do it for sure. But yeah, like the the Hogak shell, right? Just like without Hogak, maybe not. You know, like all the Seder Wayfinders and stuff, but like, yeah, is, Vendrine, is there, basically, is there, Vendrine setups. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could do that. Stitcher Supplier into Vendrine. I was trying to think of Cabal why therapy. I was looking at Dredge like a year or two ago in Legacy, and I think it probably was a supplemental product thing. I don't have think to, it was Grief. I think it was before Grief, but whatever. I have to assume so. Um, Dude, I love Dredge though. Same. Hmm. You got to at least put the fear out there for your fellow competitors, right? Do they need to dedicate some sideboard slots? That was always the question in like that era of legacy, right? How much, how much sideboard hate were you going to have for dredge? It's always a question. All right. I now have blank notepad file with just one word dredge. Dredge. Yeah, that's good. That's all you need. Interestingly enough, the other thing that's kind of going on this weekend and may lead to me double queuing is the fact that I won a arena best of one qualifier last year. So you're back in the MPL. Yeah. Which means I get to play an arena tournament this weekend if I want to, which is, I believe, best of three standard. That sounds good. And before we actually get into that, I I actually don't know how I'm going to handle this because like my piece, my actual PC is still kind of borked. I'm on a laptop right now. Uh, Basically, just like one of my fans is loose and I finally... Went digging and found like the exact specs for my fan and like ordered another one, but it gets in on Monday. Mm. So I, I think my PC will be fine without it. It'll just be like really loud and annoying, but maybe, maybe I can't actually double queue. So just you're saying loud and annoying. The, the fan itself is just like it, it moves. It just like rattles. I think it, okay, just take it out. Just take it out. You don't need it. It'll be totally fine for two days. Are you sure, man? That seems dangerous. Which, which fan is it? Is it like your your it, CPU cooler? It's for the liquid cooling. All right. Now now I'm a little concerned. <laughs> right? <laughs> it yeah. It's like different. I don't I don't want to like I, you know, I, be double queuing, be like deep in yeah, it and yeah. then just like my leg is on fire or whatever. We we don't have to do this on the podcast, but send me an I know you sent me a picture of it before. Send me another picture if you have like like my liquid cooler has two fans and if I had to use it for a day with only one fan, I think it would be totally fine. But we'll we'll figure it out. Man, I'm going to be playing the finals of the Legacy Tournament and then have to and get, you like, just, rush you just to the catch hospital. on fire. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Jerry DC in the finals. It's so unfortunate. Uh, anyway, before we talk about Standard, we should talk about this BNR announcement, which is kind of the thing that put a little spring back in my step, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think, let's see, Arena effective date, October 13th. That's today. 
Magic Online and Tabletop Effective Day three days ago, October 10th. In Standard, the Meat Hook Massacre is banned, and in Modern, Yorion Sky Nomad is banned. So I qualified with Jun Midrange in Standard, and uh, Meat Hook Massacre, you know, not not the most important card, but pretty important. And then I also won uh, RCQ with Yorion in Modern, and so they just banned both my cards, and I'm stoked. Nice to be on the right side of history when these things come down. You always want to be, you don't want to look back and be good. like, yeah, you don't want to be like, oh, I shouldn't have, I should have been playing these cards. You were. So congrats. Good decisions. Meat Hook Massacre is a very, very interesting ban. And it actually is really interesting because we just made a ban decision over in Flesh and Blood that I think actually mirrors this type of decision very closely. Essentially, we had like, there, there's a few points of difference. We We had a very good format. Whereas I think this standard format was somewhere in the middle and not necessarily very good. It's um, so okay. Let's let's talk about old standard for a second. Sure, it was good-ish, but basically uh, like eighty percent of the decks had black in it. But yeah. the games themselves were pretty interesting. Aggro was present; it wasn't dominant or anything. And then maybe you could point to a few specific things being missing where. It's really, really hard for like a hard control deck to do well. Some have popped up and done okay. It's it's really hard for aggro to be super prevalent, mostly because of the presence of things like Meat Hook Massacre and all these decks just kind of incidentally playing it. And then there's not really like a big mid-range deck. They're all, you know, tenacious underdog, kind of like small ball, but with like some big top end sort of stuff. So a lot of the decks felt kind of samey, even though they did have different colors, but the games themselves were not terrible. Yep. I'm going to dramatically simplify it and just classify it as like nothing is broken, but it feels like things could be better. It's basically the scenario. And like there's, there's no Absolutely. pressing need. And that's actually in my eyes, having now been in a similar situation, the hardest band decision to make because you cannot win. There's there's just like no way you please absolutely everyone because some people are going to be like, well, the format's good and you should just leave it as is and let things sort themselves out. And some people are, if you make no announcements, you're going to be like, this is disappointing. You know, this format could be so much better if it just had these little points of differentiation between these decks or at least like some some weakening of something that's just a little bit better than everything else and therefore incentivizes you to really tunnel in on deck selection. So it's so, so hard to deal with that well. And I think this band did so. I think it found a card that was like not critical to anything. You basically don't debilitate any of these archetypes. I think every single deck that was playing Meat Hook Massacre can evolve, be completely fine. Basically no issues. It's just different terms of engagement. And the only thing that does work against them here is the fact that Meat Hook Massacre is a very expensive card. So, but that was mostly being driven by Commander. Cor- correct. And the, so here's why I don't think it is a huge deal. Because like the theoretical world where this is a huge deal is if you have a bunch of people buying this card to play standard for their PTQs or FNMs or whatever. Correct. I just don't think that really happens. Like I'm, I'm sure some people own this card for standard and it sucks. And you certainly want to avoid that. But I think they will be able to cash out very effectively. Uh, two commander players. And so I, I don't think the financial hit as as bad as it seems, given how expensive this card is. So recently in end of September, Meat Hook was up to 80. Now it's about 60. So it, it did take a hit, yep. but not a massive one. Yeah. And, and I just don't believe there's all that many p- players who bought this for standard play. It seems very unlikely to me. The funny thing is, is that this is one of the few cards that I did not buy because nice. I was like, ah, oh, it's just, it's like so expensive and, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be playing standard or whatever. So I'll just like hold off. So when this happened, Cho messaged me and was like, God, we're so smart for not buying meat hooks. And it's like, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I was in the same boat. I never ended up purchasing them when I was putting either, I, I was mostly building for Pioneer. So it's not quite as ubiquitous in Pioneer and I wasn't playing the decks that do play it. So uh, yeah, lucked out on that one. So smart sometimes, accidentally. Accidentally smart. That's the only way I'm ever smart. Yeah, but the cool thing about this is they did pick the one card that now sort of does open the door for other strategies to exist where before, if if you're doing basically like the fun things where it's like, oh, I'm going to build like this wide battlefield and then, you know, profit 
or whatever. Meat Hook was the card that basically everyone played that really punished you. And it wasn't even just, you know, one sided uh, Wrath of God, Plague Wind type of thing. But it was also this thing that just like kept them alive, slowly killed you, you know, yeah. very, very frustrating, especially for uh, decks that were very weak to it. And now when you remove this aspect, it's like, oh, they just don't have a free sweeper in their deck anymore. Like, OK, you know, now now they have a point where they're actually weak. So as far as, you know, for example, the Jun deck that I played, it's like, oh, I think I might have to play like a burn down the house main deck or something. And that is, but there, but there are options. Reason. There's, there's so many options for you to consider it, which is why another reason why I really like this band is like, you can just shoehorn in things that are they less efficient? Are they less oh, yeah. game warping? A hundred percent. But that's but, great. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not like you're without options to try and still make this Jun deck work, which I, I really liked your Jun deck. I thought it was quite cool. It, Almost enticed me into booting up arena, not quite, <laughs> but it was, it was close, dude. It was wind grace, wasn't it? Solo, yeah, wind it grace. was, it was, and I'm I'm really happy to see that card team play. What was what has your experience been like playing that card? By the way, I'm just curious to hear Let's, it firsthand. You want to get through modern first? Uh, yeah, yeah, we could talk about modern, and and then we'll talk about standard, kind of like as a whole in the deck yeah. I played and stuff. All right, so, uh, well, first of all, we're done with standard, right? Yes, yes, good, good choice overall. Uh, a difficult band decision, but I'm happy with where they landed on it. Cool. Modern, they cite, let's see, I, th I think it was basically like Yurian was not that bad. Uh, dexterity was definitely mentioned, which I thoroughly appreciated. Yeah, I was, I was going to get into that. I was looking for the, like whether or not this was like a power level ban, like what they actually said about it. All right. Shows a strong win rate, according to our matchup data, are likely to continue to rise in popularity. And OK, so that aspect is kind of weird to me because like I was off this deck because other things were rising up, like Breach got really popular and the creativity decks did. Yep. And it, it seemed to me that it was going to get less popular, but apparently that does not mesh with the the data that they have, which is interesting. But yeah, other than that, then there's just like three paragraphs about dexterity issues and I, I love that. I mean, like we've talked about it a lot and I, I kind of felt like, I don't know, maybe we were being like silly about it and like people didn't care or whatever, but I don't know. It's, it's kind of nice to, again, like be on the, the right side of history with this. Yeah, it is. It's a little weird. Cause like, that's what the card says on its face. Like it's, it's just, it, it yeah, wasn't like, like, what did you expect? Right. It didn't develop in a way that was completely unexpected. It's just, this was always going to happen. And like, it's the type of thing you you really got to consider. But like, as far as mistakes on companions, that probably rates pretty low, honestly, considering you could eventually you could initially play them uh, at their cost and just from the exile zone. So uh, a smaller mistake as far as companions goes. Very interesting. I would love to play a game with you, Gerald. This, this looks like a lot of fun to me. Yikes. We are we are now two companions down. We have seen the death of Luris. True. We have seen Urian go. So you want to know what the next one's going to be? Uh, we're going to go through all of them, and we're going to rank them in order of when they will next be banned. Because they, I, I think we're going to get to like seven. I, I really do. Like we'll eventually get seven deep, and then like a few will survive. And I'm curious if we agree on the order at which it'll happen. Are you talking about modern specifically? Modern specifically. Yeah, we'll do modern specifically. Uh, dude, I don't even think the other ones are that... Like, I cut Gigantor from my decks. Okay. It's the I, next I, one. It's not the next one banned. So you're you're okay in doing that. That's my opinion. Okay. You think Obosh? I think Obosh is the next one banned. Yes. And then, I, I will be honest, after that point, I do think there is some chance that they start surviving. But yeah. it's way more fun if we just go through the whole list, so... I think Obosh is too narrow. The The problem with Urian and, and Luris was that I think that they were designed and kind of like expected to show up in like a very specific deck or something. And it's like, oh, no, there's just 10 decks built around this thing. Yeah. The thing is, though, the again, the narrowing of it is a thing that I think in the modern format you can do very, very well. Like it's not really all that hard to just have all ones and threes in your deck and you don't give up all that much. And I think, again, as like the format expands, especially when you go to things like modern horizons where you're actually incentivized to make more ones and you make more aggressive ones every single time you go back to it. Uh, I think Obash's days will eventually be numbered. Maybe. I don't know. 
I, I feel like I've always been very conservative as far as the companions are concerned, where it's like, ah, oh, this doesn't seem that bad or whatever. I, th- I think you have. And I, like I, Luris, Luris was the one where I was like, this is awesome. Right. And then Urian, I, I was very low on. And then when I saw like the decks that people were building, it was like, oh, okay, this is actually really good. But as far as like Gigantha, it's like even playing it a decent amount recently when testing and tuning shadow, it was like, I, I would just rather have other stuff in my deck. Like this, this thing like, comes up so infrequently, whereas Luris and Urian were a big part of your game plan. So the question is, is there eventually a version of Gigantha where Gigantha is actually a meaningful card? And that does seem possible to me. Like It's, it's possible, for sure. I mean, th- there are definitely enough things where, again, just having the extra piece of cardboard, even if you're just going to like loot it away or pitch it to something, has has mattered a ton. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I don't know. <laughs> it, it's like, I, okay, I would maybe want to have Gigantha to pitch to my fury or whatever, but those don't work together. So it kind of mm. just solves that problem. Yeah. Interesting. I, I do think Obush is next. And after that, I actually, I don't think I want to go with Gigantha. I want to go with Zerda after that because it feels yeah, like I that mean, card is always on the verge of breaking. Right. It, yeah. It has, it has a pedigree of like being banned already in legacy. So, right. Uh, I think after that, I'm ready for Gigantha. Kahira after that. Okay, oh, Kahira is good. Kahira is solid. Yeah, I, I, you know, not a broken card, but it's just like it, it's still a companion. So that's the next one to go. Uh, I guess it's Garuda after that. I feel like I'm missing one in my head right now. Oh, there's Lutri and uh, yeah. I don't know, Gazuko, <laughs> whatever the one that draws cards is. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so yes, I, I will go with stupid milling combo we won next uh then we go to weird thing that only ever worked with fires to draw cards is that one's probably pretty safe and then at the bottom of the list is lutri which i think is poetic in some ways as lutri was the first companion to ever face a ban list as it was that's banned. true preemptive <laughs> ban preemptive ban so it's kind of funny that maybe we'll reach a point you know 15 years from now where it's the only one of the companions that's still allowed to exist. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I haven't actually looked at this yet. I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised, but I've been busy with just a bunch of nonsense, but I, I am actually shocked that I have not at least done like a quick notebook sketch of what Omnath looks like without Yorian and mm-hmm. like how I would build it. But uh, that deck is still fine. Sure. <laughs> it is. It is completely fine. Let me tell you, I have not yep. looked at it. But I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why this ban announcement was such a success for me is that it just left a lot of things acceptable, whole, and felt like it was designed to improve player experience, which is it should always be the primary goal of any banned restricted announcement is just make the game better for players. That's always what you're trying to do. And these seemed like they were trying to do that and made good choices to do so. I think I think the Urian ban. So like Meat Hook is like okay, you know, you you lost your eighty dollar investment depending on when you bought the Meat Hooks, right? But you can go trade them to a Commander Player, sell them to a store, or whatever. And for Urian, it, the banning of Urian might actually make you money because you just like sell your four extra fetch lands or whatever Maybe. and take yeah. them out of your deck. Sure. So uh, that's kind of guess. This is a thumbs up for me. That's a, that's an interesting circumstance. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, I don't think the financial consequences will be that bad. I don't know. If I ordered a full art foil Urian, I I was definitely considering Ooh. it because I do have uh, a all foiled out Legacy Death and Taxes list, and I, like I was flirting with playing eighty in it, so I I might have that. I have to take a look. I did win my RCQ with a foil Urian. Okay. My <laughs> so the the companions I have in foil uh, are Luris and Urian. Yeah. And those have been banned. Well, good uh, choices, but I I think the other one that I have in foil just because it was like. 30 cents or something was the weirdo draw cards one. Okay. I was just like, ah, whatever. I'll just buy this. Yeah. I don't think that one's coming back around. No, I, I think that's fine, but you know, they can just sit in a box. It's cool. Yeah. I had a, a couple of people ask me what I would play in modern this weekend. And it's like, I really don't know. I think it's, it's so much dependent on local metagame. And I think that 
at least for Magic Online and some of the bigger events that we've had in real life, the creativity decks have really shown up in force. And yep. that was mostly a response to Omnath. But I also think that that deck is just solid in general. And I don't expect there to be much reason to just like bounce off it because Yorian got banned, for example. Yep. So I don't know. I, I honestly don't think that much changes like... I think that there are going to be some people who are still playing four color, but maybe if there's like this giant four color hole, this this giant like Omnath shaped hole in the format, uh, it's like reverse Kool-Aid man, I guess, then maybe you can exploit that somehow with like, oh, you know, my deck was great, except it only lost Omnath or whatever, you know, like maybe just like OG Murktide is really good for a weekend or something. I don't know. Yeah, flow towards fair, at least like modern's version of fair a little bit where you aren't just going to get outscaled by Omnath eventually. Right. Uh, the the biggest change that I see developing in modern is just more and more representation for Breach. It seems like that should just continue to progress. There should be more players playing Breach. And at some point, like that deck has to be respected and should show up in sufficient numbers to represent how good it is. And I don't think we're there yet. So Agreed. I, I don't know if I'm overestimating not necessarily how difficult the deck is to pilot in general, but there's just like so many moving pieces that you have to have a really good understanding of both your deck and your opponent's deck and like what you're trying to do, like what game plan you're supposed to be on and everything. Yeah. It, it feels like a deck that wins tournaments when you're at like a hundred percent efficiency, you know? And then like, if you're at 80, it's like, well, maybe top 16 or top eight or whatever, but, it, yeah, gets, I mean, it gets like great, a lot harder to win. Great players are crushing with this deck right now. Yes. That's always a sign of like there's a huge, huge amount to learn and you know, a lot of variance mitigation and a lot of diverse game plans, which I can see facially in the in the breach deck. So uh as I basically as more and more good players pick it up and as you know, players who maybe just aren't like naturally that adept with it just become good, become specialists, and really do start to understand the deck at you know a slightly slower rate they'll also start winning events as well yeah but again maybe maybe i'm overestimating that maybe you don't need to have that kind of like surgical precision to actually be super successful but that, that is kind of what it seems like to me the only deck just it's not it's not hard right but to do everything right you have to be so good yep yeah, I I do think like it has the innate power level that it could just steal a tournament where people aren't prepared. Like it it will also punish weaker players as well. Like that's another thing it really has going for it. Where if you don't know how to play against it, I do think it has opportunities to punish you. So there is some opportunity to just gin a tournament even at like a low level experience. But the consistent success demands the mastery that you're talking about. Yeah, uh, they talk about Pioneer and how player feedback has been good for the format. Uh, I I think that's reasonable. Yeah, uh, this was another, like all these formats felt very much on the fence for me where they could either see something happen or not. Pioneer, I I think people just really dislike mono green. Like that keeps coming more and more to the (laughs) forefront of format discussion. And I get it. It is is a miserable, miserable deck to play against and kind of to play with too. But I also think there are other miserable decks to play against that could very much fill that void should that deck go. So I think it's just sort of the nature of Pioneer and you have to figure out what works for you in the format. And, uh, you know, maybe it would be just as miserable to get destroyed by Lotus Field over and over. Like, <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to do that either. So, yeah. And then uh, Legacy and Vintage, they both say are in pretty good spots too. And they also cite like some new cards that have come out recently that have impacted those formats, which is cool. Legacy uh-huh. crowd didn't did not like that announcement, by the way, from what I saw. Uh, particularly the citing of cards that haven't been affecting the format, which uh, the cards they cite are apparently not affecting the format whatsoever. So. Yeah, the, so the cards they cite: Unlicensed Hearst, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, Ledger Shredder, Leyline Binding. I've seen some decks that are like, "Oh, I play a Triumph and Binding or whatever," but like the, in, I guess Fable for the Blood Moon decks, the Mono Red Blood Moon decks, but like Shredder and I mean Hearst and Sideboard, sure, but like I've I've not seen a lot of Ledger Shredder. Yeah, a lot of people felt the Delver numbers were just not reflective of what is actually happening in the format. But, you know, you got to decide your format's identity. And I I think Delver is here to stay in Legacy, so get used to it. It's, it's just always been the thing. I, I don't get it. Uh, vintage, I have no idea. I know that, uh, you know, Displacer Kitten is cool, but <laughs> that's it. I don't know if, like, it's actually good. Me neither. 
All right. Standard. Last weekend, I go to Josh shows. We have, we have a, another engagement and do that. And it's just like, all right, well, I got some time to, you know, play some of these PTQs if I want. And I had not been playing, but I had been thinking about the format, talking to Josh, watching some streams, whatever, and had some ideas and notebooked. Basically, so step one for me is like, all right, deck idea, write down all of the cards that I can think of that could potentially go in the deck that are like reasonable choices, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'll go through and be like, okay, you know, steam vents or whatever the you know storm carve coast i guess is the the reverse uh spire bluff canal it's like all right you know definitely four of those i want four of those right and i'll, I'll put in like the numbers that are like locks and to get kind of like the frame of the deck going and then if i'm feeling really ambitious i'll go to scryfall and then see if there's anything that i forgot and yep. usually there is almost certainly uh there's there's something that i missed or like something where it's like oh actually that would be a pretty good idea And eventually that will, you know, make its way into like a 60 card package and then a 75 card package. And then if I'm really, really ambitious, then I'll start looking at like sideboarding numbers, right? For this, all I did was the the list of cards. And I think I wrote like three different things where I was like, okay, these are four ofs and like this is a three of. And then, uh, you know, Josh got up from his PC and I was like, yoink, stealing that. And I just like built the deck in arena and didn't consult Scryfall. Like didn't, well, it, it, they were best in one qualifier. So I didn't actually have to look at sideboard stuff. But the first deck I built, which was the notebook thing, was this blue red deck splashing for Titan of Industry. Okay. And Cho was like, dude, this is ridiculous. This doesn't make any sense. Like this, this isn't going to work. Just play like Hulbrook or horror or whatever. And it's just like, no, no, like this, this was a deck. Like this, this was actually a thing that, that people were kind of doing at some point, you know, and I thought it was reasonable, wanted to try it. And I lost playing for my invite. So I was like, man, this deck was pretty bad, but still did pretty good. So then I went back, sat on the couch. Josh got back on the PC. I did a little bit more notebooking with the other idea that I had, which was like fixing Jund. And Josh had been playing like a lot of Jund basically with Cruelty of Gix Mm -hmm. and using that to sort of like beat up on mid-range mirrors, but always had this problem. And even like before he had a Cruelty to the deck, like the just very basic, like all four of all good cards Jund deck that I was playing had this problem against mono black where you are, you outcard them for sure because all your stuff is two for ones. And like some of their stuff is two for ones, but between like underdog and shieldred and I don't know, just them having like vehicles and meat hook and then invoke despair at their top end, you would just get burned out. Yeah. Because they get you, the reach advantage. Yeah. We so, talked about this with mono black last week or maybe two weeks ago. Uh, it, it's definitely the edge it brings to the format. Yeah. And it was just like, man, a workshop war chief, only three life. Like, come on, you know, like g- give me some more life. So then Josh started playing with like the cruelty of Gix one. And like that card punches you in the face too. So it doesn't necessarily help you. Uh, so I was like, all right, we, we got to, we got to look for something else. So for, for Josh's deck at first, I was like, you know, can we get like an Urborg? Uh, I, I, it's not restoration repossession. It's like the B raise dead gain to life kicker get another permanent okay yeah yeah and just like you know just like play play some more incidental life gain on your cards so that you have less of an issue versus playing something that gains you like a large amount of life or whatever and i think that that idea was fine but then i was like wait a second what if we just do soul of wind grace because I had kind of come to terms with the idea that you can just play Riveteer's Outlook, which is kind of like the Evolving Wilds that also gains you a life, like the Panorama. Yeah. And so it's like you have a land that goes to your graveyard that you can solve when race back. In the meantime, you're gaining a little bit of life. And then if in the mid game, you have some extra resources because you're holding back lands or... Uh, you know, like Windgrace is kind of like helping you make your land drop. So like maybe you can afford to hold back lands for sure, whatever uh, that, you know, maybe you can just like gain six life off this card. And like, this is the thing that can sit in play and maybe just buff your life total the entire time. So it's like, all right, I'm going to play some of those. I'm going to play some workshop war chief still, 
I'm going to have a couple of titan of industries at the top end. I'm not necessarily trying to reanimate it with cruelty of Gix or anything, but just like a little bit more life gain in general in the deck, right? And uh, pretty easily won the qualifier and beat a couple mono black decks along the way. Soul of Wind Grace was pretty solid, but you do kind of have to build around it. Like the the outlooks are are good. They're I mean good enough. It, it has to, yeah, it has the same problem as Streets Limited actually, where you're trying to play Blood Tithe Harvester on turn two, but like yeah. green is your splash. So if you outlook on one, it's usually to try and get your splash thing. And then it takes you off your two drops. So it's like, ah, damn it, not this again, you know? But the other thing was playing some copies of Old Rutstein. Old Rutstein. I haven't seen that one in a minute. Give me give me the text on that. Can you do it off the top of your head? Oh, my God. 1BG, 1-4, Legendary. Uh, when this ETBs or at the beginning of your upkeep, mill a card, and then it makes either 1-1 one, one Insect, a Treasure, or a Blood, depending on what you mill. Yep. And I think it's like Creature to make 1-1. One, one. And then it's land and non-land, non-creature for the other ones, but I don't know which. I think land makes treasure, maybe. So just looking for a little bit of "quote unquote" graveyard velocity. So yes, a little bit. Yes, but also, dude, if you spike a creature, you have a one-one to protect you against Liliana, because otherwise, three mana one-four into Liliana, not that good. But regardless, you're still left with a blood or a treasure if you didn't hit the insect. If you do hit an insect, you feel great. Yeah, but. Against other decks, 1-4 blocks, okay. It's not terrible. Uh, it, it's not like there are a lot of things where if you block a three-power thing that it's suddenly in danger of losing in combat or like, you know, post-combat burn spell or something like that. There's not like a lot of tracy stuff in the format like that. So it, it's a reasonable blocker. You can feel relatively safe about getting it into combat. And the early treasure token is just bananas because mm. you have workshop war chiefs and potentially titan of industry that you're ramping into you know so that can be really good but yeah just having like this extra thing that can sort of function as maybe additional fetch lands because you get two looks before you would win grace on four to mill a land and then you get maybe some additional value there but there's also the thing where you can like play win grace on five trigger on the stack discard a land to gain three and then bring it back yeah. which i don't think ever came up in my tournament because uh, that's just like a lot of lands to have, you know, like five to cast and then like another one to, to pitch and whatever. Did Wind Grace ever feel like it had the potential to solo snowball games? Like, does it ever get into that state where it's just generating so much value in and of itself that it's a game winning threat? Not really. I, I don't know if you remember when I brought this up before, but my my problem with the card was that normally threats like that, if they are left unchecked. They do kind of snowball. And I was right. like, all this thing is doing is like putting lands into play, which is good, obviously, but it's not like you have some way to pick up your lands and then cycle them away or whatever. You know, it's just like if, if they don't really care about a five, four hitting them, then you're just putting some lands into play. And they're like, yeah, maybe if you draw lands, you get to cycle those away because you probably don't need them anymore because you're doing okay on lands. And like that aspect was fine, but it never felt like, oh, this thing is just like running away with the game. It, it yeah. felt like this is a thing that ramps me, gives me a little bit of card advantage. And then it was hard to kill in some spots, which was good because I would have like all lands and some mana for the indestructible. And it, brawls pretty well with shieldred although you know makes it so you can't really take advantage of the the cycling aspect of soul because shieldred's going to deal you a bunch of damage or whatever but it, it was a reasonable body reasonable clock it it did ramp a decent amount of the time the I, and i think the incidental life gain like did matter in a lot of spots not just from discarding land to gain three but like recurring the outlooks i think wind grace is a card that's going to continue to scale as the format expands like it it takes such little support for this card to just go completely berserk like something obviously this is a very high-end example but something like a satyr wayfinder type effect where you're just consistently loading up your graveyard and able to better leverage uh the, the land's ability and then what it really feels like is going to take it to the next level is when there's something modal that is also scaling. So something that you want to play in oh, the yeah. early game, but when you hit the late game, it turns into this game winning threat because it either kicks or, you know, it's just an X spell that scales very well, like a devil's play type effect. Then I think this card's going to go absolutely berserk. And I'd be very surprised if it doesn't reach that state by the end of the format. Yeah, me too. 
Yeah, t- like I had to play Titan of Industry because you needed some amount of top end if you're just going to be putting a bunch of mana into play, right? Yep. And yeah, you you want the X top end, like when you find your your Hydroid Crisis, right? And then yeah. this card becomes absurd. Yes, exactly. I, I would be much happier with Titan if it costs like four or seven, depending yep. on what I wanted. But yep. uh, yeah, uh, I mean, there, there were definitely games where I had Soul, but nothing in my graveyard on turn four, and it was sad. And usually I found something else to do. You know, I was like, all right, I'll just kill your stuff or whatever and, and wait. And there were times when I had a soul in play that they didn't want to try and kill because I had mana open and a potential land in my hand. And then I had like a second soul in my hand. So like it being legendary and kind of hard to kill was like, ah, this is kind of annoying. And in the meantime, it's not really gaining me any advantage. So it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, but I do think that the deck did a lot of what I wanted. And after winning the thing, like, you know, posted in our discord and, posted the list and like wrote up some thoughts on it and stuff and built a sideboard for it. And people, people seem pretty happy about it. It's just like Jun mid range soul of wind grace. Like these things are all things that people tend to enjoy. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how closely uh, you followed the moto results this week. I mean, they're kind of lame duck at this point with the meat of massacre band, but it, it was won by Jun featuring soul of wind grace. I don't know how close it was to your list at least one of the standard challenges was. So it, it does seem like this idea is picking up steam. And I, I think for a lot of the reasons you stated, it's just a, a really nice, flexible tool that is lining up pretty well with the format right now. I'm, I'm looking now. I'm looking now. Yeah, I don't remember if it was the, the Sunday or the Saturday event. I hope it's Saturday because Sunday is like usually smaller. Also second place, oh, Daniel Akos, Holebreaker Horror, still just so committed to the idea of whole breaker or oh yeah I, I love the commitment okay so on sunday it was won by Jund. uh there there are some similarities but there are a lot of differences too okay so i i started like looking at the numbers i was like oh this is this is like pretty similar to mine like two war chief two titan three soul four harvester but then there's also three cruelty of gix which i did not have there's no riveteer's charm they have uh, a couple tenacious underdogs, a couple graveyard trespassers. Like I, I don't think that this stuff is bad by any means. Where yeah. it's like, you know, trespasser underdog just having like more of a board presence, I think is completely reasonable. I did really like Riveteer Strum though. It was like such a clean answer to Shield Rid or just like killing a Planeswalker or whatever. It was super nice. And then that was the sort of modal thing where it's like this really good removal spot early, and then just like draws you some cards in the late game. Mm, yeah. Uh, but this one has a lot of voltage surges and cut downs, whereas uh, I had flame blessed bolts for underdogs, which I think is kind of necessary, honestly. Like it's a problematic card. Like it, it, it's it's long term influence over the game is so messed up. Yeah, and the big thing I think is <laughs> so I was I was building this deck on Josh's computer where he was sitting on the couch and. I like he was, you know, he's like buried in his phone, uh, League of Legends world stuff was going on. So he's like looking at that stuff. So I, I was hoping that he was not paying attention to what I was doing, basically, because uh, there was some stuff in my deck that I think that he would have called out as being sus, where it's like, you know, I, I basically I broke John by like cutting two of the tri lands. <laughs> this is like what I said afterwards. And so, like, for example, this deck has four Trilands and four Riveteers Outlooks. And it's like, oh, well, I really don't think you want that many ETB tap lands, but whatever. Uh, and and also, like, he he saw me. He was just like, at, at some point he made some comment where he's like, two Rudsteins. Huh? We're just, like, adding Rudsteins. Like, <laughs> just look, max look, Rudstein. Man, look, I'm closer to adding the third than I am going down to one. Sometimes it'd be like that. Like, Rudstein, Rudstein is nice, okay? Yeah, okay, so this is kind of like the Moto influence, too. This this deck has two Namata Primeval Warden in the sideboard. Yeah, I am presently hovering over that so I can learn what Namata Primeval Warden does. And I, I was looking at some of the Moto lists. Here's what I found. Uh, what, what did Siri find for you? Oh, Siri is actually telling me what Namata Primeval Warden does. So oh. thank you. I didn't ask for that. It's super creepy, but now I have the text in front of me on my watch. Okay, nice. I, so afterwards, when I was trying to build a sideboard for the deck so I could like post things in the Discord, I was looking at some of the Moto decks and they all had, a bunch of them had Namata in the sideboard. I was just like, why? Uh, these these Moto folks, they're they're an interesting group. They have a lot of faith in each other. I'll say that. 
and, and their ideas tend to replicate back and forth. Yeah. But to, to meet hooks main, I had probably a third one in the sideboard and I, I think that you can cut them and mostly be fine. Do you still want access to sweepers though? So I think something like a burn down the house main would be serviceable. Not certainly not great, but we'll get the job done and obviously play some more of that stuff in the sideboard. I don't know if it means that you want a cheaper sweeper against aggro decks. If you start looking at something like choking my asthma or if there's a better option, I was what really about hoping- elder elder dragon war. Does that just not work? Like is the double red problematic because discarding cards and drawing that many is something that you could really take advantage yeah, of. Yeah. I mean that, that card's fine. I just think like all modes on it are pretty underwhelming. Sure. I, I think there, there's three of them though. Like that's, that's what I know. sells me on the card, but I know y- you're spot on. They all are, you know, not game breaking. That's for sure. Honestly though. I, so th- thinking back on it now, the, Almost certainly like the reason I won the qualifiers just because of Fable. Like Fable is so absurd. And I know that that is a known quantity at this point, but just the amount of times that I actually got to like copy things with the reflection. That's high. is just absurd. Yeah. I mean, what do you make of the decision to, I think, I think a lot of people would have expected Fable as the card to be banned in standard. It's certainly the most powerful card in standard, right? Like I don't think anyone would debate that point. What do you think about the decision to let it have some more time? Well, it would just look really weird if that was the only thing that you banned because yes, all the decks are black and a lot of them are red, but it, I mean, it's it's things like Meat Hook showing up in all of these decks that insulates them against a wide variety of strategies, right? So if you want to get rid of Meat Hook and Fable, okay, that makes more sense. But if you just ban Fable, it's like, I mean you're not really hurting the black decks all that much. It's like all the decks that were lightly splashing red for Fable and Harvester, are just like, well, I, I go back to playing Mono Black now, whatever. What's really interesting is that Fable probably gets better after this ban, right? Like, it's it's not like you would play Meat Hook Massacre as an answer to Fable, but it was okay. It sort of lined up well with what the card was doing in a lot of instances, at least as like a catch-up mechanism after they had gained this two-creature advantage. Yeah, it, um, it was one of the few like sort of clean answers. Like obviously your opponent got the filter of. still, but yeah. you're still getting like a little bit of value from the meat hook too. And I really liked Unleash the Inferno. I mean, for a lot of reasons, but like it, it being a clean answer to Fable was like really nice too, even if you're overpaying by a mana. Yeah, Fable is just going to have an outsized influence on Standard. And I still go back to my main point about these sagas which was always my contention with them it has so little to do with the text on the card but also the text on fable is really good but eventually one of these cards was going to produce too much cardboard and that is you find yourself in basically like the bone crusher giant state where the card simply offers you too much for a single card and i think that's where we are no i definitely agree Man, looking at some of these other deck lists, there's a blue-white control deck that has two Sanctuary Wardens at the top end. Like, that's yep. kind of rad. Yeah. Sanctuary yeah. Warden was another card that I was looking at that uh, I didn't play because I was kind of like on this Titan of Industry hype train or whatever. But yeah, I'd, you know, thinking about it, I want to go back and build some Sanctuary Warden decks too. Yeah, this this is actually an Esper deck, which I, I think is pretty interesting. And I, I'm pretty sure it's just for Siphon Insight. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it's like Rafine's Tower and some other stuff. It's yep. very light black component. Yep, yep. And I, I like Siphon Insight quite a bit. It's a card that impressed me the more I played with it and never quite had a home. Uh, I don't know if there's other options that you'd go as far as splashing in, into Siphon Insight in your deck. But uh, yeah, interesting, interesting approach. And I think, again, standards remains interesting despite the fact there are some power outliers and there is good cycling going on and sort of innovation. So I'm excited to see what happens after this Meat Hook Massacre ban. Well, we see blue-white or blue-red control in second, blue-white control in third. So, yep. you know, the stuff I was saying about those decks not being very well represented, it's like, well, they these folks found uh, some pretty good ways to implement these things and work on them, so... Yeah, and if you go all the way down to 10th place in the same event, there's like a, a Jeskai control-ish thing uh, with Fabled Mir- Mirror Breaker, Four Wandering Emperor, uh, again, Sanctuary Warden at the top end. So it's, it does seem like blue control is starting to find its footing a little bit and starting awesome. to find a path forward. Yeah, that's great. I'm gonna Now I'm going to keep scrolling all the way down and see if this was uh, only seven rounds of Swiss, which, yeah, seven rounds. 
Yeah, it was, so, it, was like, you know. it was like a big ish seven rounds. Um, oh well, I guess one, four, and three made top eight. That's kind of awkward. That is awkward, for sure. Well, okay, no, maybe maybe that means that this was six rounds actually. Oh, so it's a really small one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I. I mean, still, I. There's still something interesting to be gleaned from it, and like you, you take the tournaments as you find them, and this is where we're getting our standard information at the moment. So. Yep. Uh, you gotta. You know, always take it with a grain of salt, but still, oh. it's good to see people finding success. Uh, the same soul deck won both challenges. Interesting. Same player? No, different player. Interesting. So yeah, deck deck is doing well. I like my version, you know, but whatever. I'm, I'm just happy to see soul in the mix. One of my favorite cards from preview season. Did we, I think we included it in our top 10. I think I, I battled for that one pretty, pretty tenaciously and, and eventually got there. Uh, maybe it was our honorable mention, but I, I hope to see that card more and more as standard goes on. Well, I, I think you might, at least for now. But yeah, I, I don't know how viable it is for me to play Legacy, especially if I play like blue-white control while also double queuing like best mm. of three standard or whatever. So my plan uh, at the time, like before I even qualified, was like, oh man, do I have to play like Gruel Aggro or something? Like, something that I can just basically like F6 with and not think about. And I, I, I think I might still have to do something along those lines or just not play. I could also just not play, but. Yeah, I, I would say queue up with something that is like very low effort. If you start to put a run together, then you can adjust appropriately and figure out how much energy you can devote to it. But, uh, you know, see if you scoop up those like two early wins or whatever, and then maybe then you start paying attention. Yeah, I believe I believe it's free. So at the very least, like I can join. Uh, the other thing is like we, we we're playing these qualifiers, right? And like the payouts were not bad, I guess. I think uh, going like four and two came out ahead in gems a little bit. Uh, and I went like five, one, six, one and uh, like four, two with mono black, I think. So so like, you're gem rich now. Yeah, I'm. Well, I got. I got a little bit. You know, send, send me some tank. some soul of wind grace, and maybe I'll get back in the mix. Yeah, I had to. I had to craft all those, but I've been very, very conservative with my wild cards, and had been drafting a decent amount. So, I think my wild card situation is, it's it's okay. You know, I still have like fifty rares or something, so I'm doing all right. Good. Good. I'm glad to hear you've sorted that out for yourself. If I have to play Gruel Aggro, though, I think all my rares are gone because, like, all the all the you know, like Grizzly Bears that I would play mm, at two mana are all rare. And it's yeah, like, oh, that's man. unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, man. If if you want to think about legacy, you know, I, I think we should just call this like real legacy. I I would love that. I don't know if that's going to help it get support and uh, momentum, but that that certainly makes sense to me. And yeah, you think about that. Think about a way for me to make Grixis viable without the backbone that is Baleful Strix. I would be all about it. Seems. Nah, I just think I just think you're supposed to play Lion Side Diamond. I know, but I'm not smart enough. I'm definitely not smart enough for Storm. I I could I could play Dredge. Yeah, you can Dredge. Dude, what was the thing that made me want to Dredge? Was it? It couldn't have been like Prized Amalgam. That was way way long ago. I think it's just life, man. When life when life hands you lemons, <laughs> you just you just go dredge. You just dredge on people. Yeah. Hmm. Game. Good luck.